and welcome. This is Mary Ellen McGonigal here with Erin Swenlin with Chart Wise Women. This is our last show for Women's History Month, and it's very exciting. We have a top peak panel here with us today, and it's going to be all about women and finance. So let's not waste a minute. We have uh, Linda Rashke and also Danielle Shea here with us joining us today. And they're going to share with us their background, uh, what they are doing now currently, and also sharing some insights as to what is it like being a female in a male dominated industry. So uh, Linda, I'm going to go ahead and uh, let you start, share with us a little bit of background and information as to uh, who you are. Yeah, I um, actually started on the trading floors back in 1981, so I had a little bit roundabout start and uh, just kind of morphed there into eventually becoming a CTA and a hedge fund manager. And so I really started on, on a trading career as opposed to an institutional background. So there's going to be a difference there, I'm sure. Um, institutional, such as Goldman Sachs and that type of thing, um, have come a long ways in knocking down barriers, but of course there are no barriers when you're own you're your own uh, your own boss. So um, yeah, that's how I started. Wow, yeah, I'm sure we will get more into that because I love how uh, calmly you just throw out that you had a hedge fund and that kind of thing, and that's even in today's environment is highly accomplished. So hopefully we'll get more into that. And Danielle, as far as uh, your background and brought you up through the ranks here? Well, um, it's actually quite quite the opposite of that. About It was about 10 years ago. I was actually teaching elementary school and um, I had just had my son and I wanted to be able to work from home, um, make money from home, being a teacher. I mean, it just, it was great and everything, but the money was not that good. And so I had come across John Carter and I started learning from him online um, how to how to trade. And um, he's talked about you a lot, Linda. He said that he's learned a lot from you um, over the years. And so I actually got into this completely um, in a self-made manner. I didn't study finance or economics. My degree was actually in international uh, rights and law. And I got into wow. this just by learning online. And so over yeah. time, you know, studied learn more and here I am today. Wow, fantastic. Funny how we wander into uh, careers. Erin, I'll give you a few minutes here to yes. give us some of your highlights. Yes, I feel like I'm kind of a combination between Linda and Danielle. You know, I didn't come up with inst come up through institutions. Um, I learned a lot of this from my father. And, you know, as he said that I should say, I came into it kind of kicking and screaming. I don't think I agree with that so much, but I started helping him with stuff in high school, um, calculating the OBV back then with the spreadsheets and a pencil and a calculator. Um, went on my own way in the Air Force and just sort of dropped out of that, except when he'd call me and ask me to solve algebra equations for him. <laughs> so I would solve the equations for him. I had no idea really what he was putting into them, but I made sure that they all came out right. So it was all about math. And then uh, after I got out of the service, I had my baby, uh, my babies and um, started working with him on our website and just start, it started to really pique my interest of uh, the actual content of the website. And mm -hmm. from there, I just said, yeah, I want to do this. Um, I want to take over the company and wow. kind of Very ended good. up in there that way. Super. Yeah. I And I've watched the evolution certainly here over the past few years. It's uh, been great. I A bit of background for me, it was a very lucky accident. I was in New York City right after college and I went to a temporary agency to place me at a, any firm just so I can get my foot in the door and figure out what this corporate life was all about. My first position was at Goldman Sachs on their trading floor. I was taking over for a woman who had to have a back operation and I was low man on the totem pole, but really it was just so super exciting. I knew I had to have this in my life. And I sat next to a woman who 
mentored me. And uh, the rest, they say, is history. Went on to manage money and so forth. And uh, for me, I can say very clearly that working with self-directed investors as opposed to running big corporate money is absolutely the most rewarding thing. Certainly for me, I, I get emails very regularly, people saying that I'm changing their path in their life, uh, teaching them how to trade stocks. So super exciting, as I'm sure you ladies would agree. Um, so let's let's dial back just a little bit. I'm going to take each of you back to uh, your childhood, high school, back in that period, and ask uh, Danielle. We'll start with you. When you were in that those earlier years, did you ever think that you would find yourself here? Was this something on your radar? No, definitely not. Even when I was starting, I didn't think it was on my radar. <laughs> it's funny. No, I mean, I actually have avoided math and science my entire life. I've always been really good at reading and writing and languages. Um, I'm fluent in Spanish. I, you know, like I said, I was studying international law and human rights. I mean, that was a lot of reading, writing, literature, that kind of thing. Um, I've studied French, Portuguese, but I've always hated math and science. I mean, even when uh, my dad first suggested I started to follow John, I thought he was completely crazy. And the only reason I did it was because I tried to find any other online job. And at that point in time, I mean, there was really nothing. So even when I first started, I, I still thought it was crazy. But what I discovered was that I love languages and I love patterns and reading the charts is really just about reading a language. And so even though, you know, not the best at um, high level math, it doesn't really matter because the platform can do that aspect for me. And the part that I'm good at is really just reading the patterns. True. And I would argue also intuition plays a big part as women. I feel that we are a little more enlightened as it relates to that. Linda, we're going to take you back uh, to your younger years. And curious was uh, the idea of going into finance part of your vocabulary back then? No, but honestly, uh, you know, if I look back in high school, nothing was part of my vocabulary except, you know, trying to stay out of trouble. So I wasn't really thinking that far ahead. You're just thinking about what college are you going to get into, you know, so planning for finance, you know, when you're a teenager, you know, in college, you know, it's same, same different thing. It's like trying different hats and seeing uh, what fits. So, you know, I got a degree in um, music composition. I really thought, Actually, that in high school, I thought it was going to be a, a, a um, you know, music engineer and, and uh, film uh, scoring I really wanted yeah. to get into. But um, and that's an even tougher field. Actually, there's fewer women in that field. Um, but I got a degree in economics as well. And, uh, you know, then um, became more interested in, in the markets, you know, in college mm -hmm. and stuff. So. Yeah, interesting. Uh, Linda, I'm going to ask you to elaborate a little bit further as far as at what point did this concept of financial analysis make its way to you coming out with a music major and making that hard right turn, maybe? Yeah, I, I had a degree in economics, too, and I was part of something at the college that I went to called the Charles R. Blythe Fund, where a uh, an anonymous donor set up a uh, an account. It was only a hundred thousand dollars, but that was something back in you know the late 1970s. And um, you applied to be on the board of directors. So 12 students were nominated to the board of directors, and once a week we would meet and make decisions in terms of allocations. And this was an interesting period because it was back in the late 1970s, you know, when you had crazy uh, downturn in the market and crazy inflation and all that oh, kind yeah. of stuff. So it's pretty interesting. And um, so it was just being around it, you know, and seeing that, ah, you know, I can do that. So I, I thought, you know, when I graduated from college, I would go up to San Francisco and become a stockbroker because that would provide me more access towards mm -hmm. the markets. You know, it's just not a viable option when you're 21 years old. So <laughs> right, right. Oh my goodness. Sounds like a great path. And Danielle, we'll just spend a minute because I know your dad was very instrumental in your making it, making your way into finance. Is he still visible part of uh, you or maybe you've flown the coop, I'm sure. 
Well, we actually love trading together. I mean, in the beginning, um, you know, he talked to me a lot about the stock market. He's always been in the market. I mean, he's been an investor and a trader for a long time. And in, in the beginning, it, I mean, I just never really had any interest until it dawned on me that that's how I could make money without working for someone. And so it was never really the financial aspect that was interesting to me and being in finance. It was what it would allow me to do. And so, you know, being able to be at home, trade with my dad. I mean, we love doing that still. I mean, my parents were just here for a week for my son's spring break. And, you know, we hang out, we look at charts, we trade and we swap strategies. And so, I mean, he's definitely a really integral part in um, my now love for trading. And I'm so glad that he introduced me to it because I never would have imagined where it would have taken me. I don't think he ever did either, but I'm very grateful for his involvement for sure. So I guess a family that trades together stays together. Linda, I don't know if your family was a big part of uh, maybe is your husband active in the markets or are you the, a solo preneur in the financial uh, space? You know, um, you know I, I was sort of a black sheep, you know, when I uh, graduated from college, you know, I mean, I had had a falling out with my dad four years earlier, so I didn't get that same type of um, mentorship. But, you know, my dad did look at charts and stuff when I was growing up. So it was, you know, around that. Um, and, uh, I, you know, I, I, my first husband ended up being a trader from the trading floor, you know, so that, but he ended up being the Mr. Mom, you know, so I, my career uh, launched and I, you know, I became, like I said, a CTA and hedge fund manager and all. And I probably would not have been able to do that and have a kid if there hadn't been one parent being the Mr. Mom. So he did the grocery shopping, the cooking, you know, uh, took the kid to school and all that kind of stuff. And I wore the pants in the family and that allowed me to accomplish the things that I did. So, and, you know, and then after I uh, got divorced, um, I was single for 10 years. And then my second husband was my original S and P broker in the pit. So again, I've always been around, you know, people in the business. So a very, uh, limited view on the world there. I'd, I'd say you have a type. I would. <laughs> <laughs> and yeah. Danielle, I know, uh, I'm familiar certainly with your husband. He is with simpler trading and a very, uh, active part of that company. And I'm sure that might help pave the way, certainly at least for your technological, uh, he is the head of IT for uh, Simpler. So I'm sure that helps that he's uh, in the industry as well. Yes, it definitely helps. And I mean, you know, it's funny exactly what you're saying, Linda, because I, that's what I need, a Mr. Mom. And my <laughs> husband has... <laughs> Uh, since the work from home, he's been getting, you know, a little bit more uh, transferred into uh, a role of more cooking and cleaning and being around more, which is amazing because it is difficult as a woman in finance. And I mean, before the pandemic, I mean, I was going to New York like almost every three weeks, every month. And I'm, you know, I'm gone for four or five days. And I'm coming back and it's very difficult having a small child. But I mean, being able to have family that supports you and my husband's really great now. He does run the technology and he has set up my amazing setup here that you can't see, but maybe I'll post a picture on Twitter or something. But um, he's always in the background. He's always in his office over there. Um, anytime something breaks. And also, I mean, he's great to bounce trading ideas against because, I mean, he's worked for simpler trading for 10 years. I mean, back when the company was just starting and they were just working out of an apartment building. So, you know, we love bouncing trade ideas off each other. And I mean, it's it just, especially when you're just in a, you know, a highly stressful career and you're trying to, you know, raise a family, like it is really important to have, you know, a husband or somebody that's helping support you. And that's thankfully what he does for me. So 
Yeah, absolutely. And I would agree totally as far as having that support system for 15 years. I traveled the globe as far away as Iceland. I spent two weeks in Europe and a week in New York. And my support system, I would say we had uh, au pairs from Europe, from Sweden, and they would come and stay with us for years. It was just so interesting, certainly for my children to grow up with that. But just really having that safety net uh, makes all the difference. And we know as women, you know, and I, my partner at the time was a female. And when we went on trips, we packed it back to back to back meetings. We thought we were away from our family. We are going to make every second count so that we can hurry back home and be with our little ones. So let's just take a minute here and talk about, we kind of delved a little bit into what it's like or what it was like potentially when you were entering into this field as a female. Curious, are you feeling any of the, I would say pains or certainly uh, it was a little bit of a ceiling there. Uh, Linda, we can start with you as far as have you seen in your estimation, uh, any kind of a shift or, or I'm certainly, we are seeing more females make it to the top of the um, proverbial corporate totem pole. Um. I honestly never felt anything that being a woman mattered one bit, you know, uh, on, uh, you know, if anything, there were slight advantages because, you know, people might go out of their way to help you a little bit more. Um, you know, you're a little bit of a novelty. I never felt discriminated against, you know, there's pros and cons, like with everything on one hand, you're not part of the boys club that might be sharing information or networking on that you know, degree. On another hand, you had people explain things to you taking a little bit more time than they might for another younger guy, you know. So you just uh, make the best of the situation. And, uh, you know, truly for me, it was always a bottom line business, you know. And I, I got the feeling that as long as you had something to contribute, even if it's you know, being invited to speak at international conferences or something like that, I do think that they went out of their way to try and get females equally as well as males because it makes it interesting. So I can honestly say I've never felt one moment of discrimination. And of course, for me, you know, being a hedge fund manager and stuff, it's all bottom line, you know, and uh, if anything, most of the clients that I dealt with were fund of funds. So they want to have an allocation to different CTAs. I didn't deal with as much individual investors. And so for the fund of fund managers, you know, it looks good on their books if they say, oh, yes, we have, you know, some diversification across the board here, both in styles and, you know, all kinds of different uh, composite profiles. So, um, you know, it's, uh, it, it always looks good on their side to have a female. Of course, the performance is everything. You're not going to be there if you don't have the performance. True, true. I, I, I never saw anything, yeah. And Danielle, I would say as a female, I have seen you certainly on TV, on various shows, and I still feel it's a little bit of a novelty. I happened upon, uh, you were, I cannot recall the name of it, but an online trading and the comments were just fast and furious uh, as, as far as how delightful it was to, to have an intelligent woman speaking about stocks and about the markets. And I'm wondering, have you found anything uh, as, as it relates to your experience or how you've been treated because you are a female or maybe not so? Same with uh, similar to Linda. Um, you know, I think that it was very weird for me in the beginning. You know, I was pretty young at the time when I first got into it. And I mean, I never really felt any kind of discrimination, you know, from my company, like the company that I work is amazing. All the men are great. You know, they're happy to have me. Um, I've never felt any kind of discrimination from like the producers I work with. They're all awesome. The the place where I've had just some weird touch points have just been other people in the world. <laughs> For example, you know, I'll go to, I mean, I remember, you know, one time I was in the pool in Puerto Rico and, you know, just sitting there making conversation with somebody sitting next to me and they're completely do not believe that I'm in the stock market, you know, <laughs> don't believe it. They're like, no, that's no, I, I I don't believe you. What's your name? I want to look it up. And I mean, I've had other things where, you know, I'll, I'll go and 
I'll check in at a conference that I'm speaking at and I'm always with my husband and people always assume that he's the speaker, not me. Or like I'll, one time I checked into a TV studio and they thought that I was um, the receptionist coming to bring food for a meeting they're having and they don't realize that I'm actually the speaker on TV. Like I've had things like that, but not anyone, you know, directly that I'm working with in the industry. So well, good, good to hear that. I mean, uh, it's, <laughs> we don't need that extra uh, barrier, if you will. And Erin, I'm just going to ask you, we, you and I have spoken about this and there was a, an event that we traveled for together and we were having an evening beverage at the bar and a similar experience with a gentleman that uh, was just going on and on about stocks. And when we mentioned that he, we were in the industry, dead silence, disbelief. <laughs> but Erin, if you would like to please share uh, as, as it relates to women coming up through the ranks. And yes, and I was telling um, Linda and Danielle before we started, you know, the only time I really found that I had uh, issues with maybe, you know, discrimination or being treated differently was actually when I was getting my math degree at USC. Um, a lot of the professors were very you know, it was like, oh, you're such a cute little, you know, blonde thing, like you don't know anything like they, they would, um, the expectations were different. They didn't want to help me as much. They just kind of assumed that I was dumb. Um, it, I felt like I had to work a lot harder than the boys did in college. But I have to say after that, you know, I went into the Air Force. So I was definitely a minority there. And I never felt really, the only thing I felt was just some odd behavior, you know, and just the flirtations and, and things like that, just that wouldn't happen, obviously, if I were a, another male, you know, officer or whatever, but just getting those sort of weird vibes now and then. But, uh, you know, really in this business, I think it's, it's, um, it's been great. I feel like I've been a novelty at times. I know I was the only female on staff at stockcharts.com for a really long time. So, you know. Until I barged on the scene. That's right, until we got you in there. <laughs> Get some more representation. <laughs> Raise the bar. Um, yeah, so let's talk a little bit about women and as far as what's taking place now, and we can just maybe spend a minute if, if anyone, uh, Danielle, we can certainly start with you. If you feel, is there more that can be done? Or I get a sense from you, Linda, that you feel that uh, things are fine. And as long as you produce, there are no barriers. So Danielle, maybe take a minute here and share with us if you have any thoughts on what more can be done for women, or maybe your path was uh, quite smooth and everything is, is as it should be, maybe. I mean, I don't really feel like there's a barrier necessarily. I mean, I think most people who have a more traditional path, I mean, you know, you go, you get a degree and, and just like some of you ladies said, you know, you, you don't necessarily have problems in that area. I feel like for me, it was more of a mental barrier. I, I always felt like I'm not good at math. I'm not good at science. How, how could I do anything in the stock market? I, I don't understand. You know, I don't that's not something I could do. And I feel like a lot of people who I meet and who I talk to, um, they resonate with the fact that, you know, I was a teacher, you know, I wasn't doing anything. <laughs> I was not doing high level mathematics in any way, shape or form. I was teaching sixth grade. And so when I talk to other women who say, Hey, you know, I want to find a way to work from home and I want to invest, but I just, I think it's, too difficult. Um, I think that that's kind of a barrier they put on themselves. And that's a barrier that I try to break because I try to show people that, you know, this is something that you can learn. I learned online and now, you know, I'm, that's what I do. I teach online. I'm on TV all the time. And if I can do it, you can do it type of thing. But I don't feel like it's, you know, the industry is not welcoming to women because I have been very welcomed in the industry. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I would agree. And that is wonderful to be a role model and to pave the way for other women. It uh, really is still something that doesn't come immediately to mind for women. And Linda, I know you have uh, written a very famous book 
and other publications out there. Do you find that you get a lot of questions more from women or that might feel more comfortable with, with your presence or maybe it's mixed? No, I don't, honestly. <laughs> I mean, I get questions, sure. You know, I can answer some, others I can't. But, um, you know, I've put out a lot of free YouTube videos and content out there. Everything I do is for free. You know, I uh, I mean, I've made my money trading, so it's a different field. You know, I don't want to cater to get clients or anything like that, you know. And I just think that um, the biggest thing that I see is that people grossly underestimate how long the learning curve takes, you know, at least if you want to um, – make your living trading okay profits from trading have that be your sole source of income i would say that it's really maybe five percent make it whether you're male or female you know everybody can have a profitable account and you know have a twenty thousand dollar account and be up at the end of the year but to be able to pay your mortgage and buy food and that kind of thing i mean maybe three percent and i think i really have not seen any difference if it's a male or female all i see is that it's a time commitment that everybody underestimates the men underestimate it too you know so yep. um that's my main comment yeah and i agree i just had a phone call with a, a client of mine for two years now she's uh has made it a point to reach out she took my course two years ago and i was working with her and it was pretty much the two-year mark and she just thanked me profusely and said i finally feel confident. And I said, you know, it's not spoken up too often, but it does on average statistically take about two years of steady activity, undergoing trading and really learning. Doesn't mean you can't make your way on your way to that two year mark, but I found it very interesting. And Erin, I know you and I have talked about this as well, as far as working with women. And I know you have a live trading room twice a week. Are you finding uh, more women that are joining that trading room? Or? No, I would say that, you know, the, the makeup of those trading rooms is still, women are quite a minority in there. Uh, maybe 20% are female. Uh, I think, Danielle, you made the best point. I think it really is a mental thing. You know, women, um, especially, you know, when I grew up, you know, typically you didn't get into the science and math and, you know, it was all about being at home, being a mom. Um, you know, obviously I, I went against that trend when I was very young, but, um, I think that really, when we talk to women, Mary Ellen, I think that's one of the things that is really common is, oh, I, I don't think I can do this. Um, it, it's too complicated. And like you said, Danielle, oh, I have to learn math and I'm going to have to do all this stuff and understand equations. And it's not really what it's about. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I agree. Uh, I think we're going to steer a little away from the women in finance. We've um, spoken a lot about it. We can end with that. But I just want to get to know you guys a little bit more. Uh, Linda, how about outside activities? Do you have hobbies outside of the market that uh, some of us, I'd, I'd love to hear about it? I, I do. I mean, I think everybody has to have a hobby that releases the stress after trading and stuff. I, I, um, I have four dressage horses and train and I have two farms. Wow. So I, I compete down here in Wellington. That's where I live now. And um, I try to play tennis four times a week. I used to uh, be a bodybuilder and work out in the gym, but now my shoulders are too arthritic, so I can't do that anymore. I love gardening. I love plants and, you know, putting my hands in the dirt and stuff. So um, most of the activities I do, though, are like more, um, they're not team activities. It's like where I can be by myself and just be, you know, meditative, doing my own thing, sort of therapeutic in that regards. But yeah, I have to, I think most people have to do something to physically release as well as get your mind 100% off the markets to recharge those batteries. So that's mm -hmm. really important for me. And certainly I would think riding horses, you would need to practice that focus, paying attention and being always on mark. And that's a sport that's always interested me in the sense that it you can uh, carry on into later years and still be quite good. I, I know just from watching the Olympics and so forth, they've had champions that have been uh, pro 
in that sport for maybe four to five different uh, consecutive Olympic. You can't do that mm -hmm. in any other sport. So uh, that that's very interesting. Um, Danielle, I know you have a very, very active son who keeps you quite busy. And uh, anything else outside of that, roller skating or? <laughs> <laughs> that you I mean, mostly I just try to spend time with my family. I mean, it's a very, uh, trading is very mentally all encompassing. And, um, you know, the reason why I got into it to begin with was so that I could spend more time with my son. I feel like I got away from that, just building my career and everything in, in the first, especially five years. And now at this point, he's eight, almost nine. And so I have tried to set more boundaries and, you know, go to his, he, he does baseball and Taekwondo. And um, he, I coached his soccer team this fall, which was wow. interesting. So I, I feel like I, you know, I try to do the working mom thing. And then I try to do the actual mom thing. It's, it's a little difficult sometimes, but I, I love gardening as well. So I have a huge garden, lots of plants. Wow. You can see. Um, and I really like to cook. I'm starting a food blog just for kind of a, a creative release. So <laughs> well, I can't cooking, wait to start reading. Gardening family. <laughs> Thanks. That's fantastic. You can grow your own, uh, herbs and uh, recipe ingredients. That's great. Erin, I know you yes. and I, yeah, no, that's fantastic. Erin, uh, I know in the past on shows, somehow it's come up that you like bowling. I know. Yes, I, 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 I do like to bowl. Oh, I'm not on a league or anything. Honestly, <laughs> my, my daughter uh, said it very well. I didn't believe her when she said it. She says, mom, you're a gamer. Like I'm a gamer. What are you talking about? Um, I, spend a lot of time playing on my iPad. And I will admit to the last month, I have spent a lot of time on Fortnite. <laughs> I don't know, maybe it's great. You can get on there and shoot people and just, you know, totally immerse yourself in a different world than what's going on around you. So um, that and my dogs, my dogs keep me busy with just everything else but yeah i have to ask I you, you just say say a a oh oh aaron just a minute linda you had a question. yeah i was gonna say i have to uh, ask you because i just finished this book on audible one ready player <laughs> have you read it or heard of it they I actually have not. i really should oh my god you have to you have to um read it or listen to it on audible because it'll be right up your alley i promise <laughs> so it's totally about a, a gaming world 20 45 in the year 2045. Oh, wow. Oh, wow. Interesting. Yeah, I, like it. I, I just, it's really cool. I just uncovered a book called uh, Bowling Alone. <laughs> it's oh. just, and it just, it yeah, the concept, you know, that uh, it, it is a team sport and uh, <laughs> it's fun. And, it's really yeah. fun. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I, I love it. Wonderful. My back hopefully will continue to let me do that for many years to come. We'll see. <laughs> yeah, I I can say I, me I do spend a lot of time with my dogs. They're a big part of my life. Three walks a day, and luckily I'm right across the street from a lovely big park. And it uh, is pretty. Get three get... three walks a day. <laughs> I was gonna say lucky dogs. <laughs> they <laughs> are, but they're so cute. They're they're uh, uh, oh, yeah dogs. bigger bigger dogs, but they look. I mean. Honestly, the excitement, the sheer excitement when I get those leashes out, it just makes it so worth it. They're they're good. So uh, that's, that's that so gets, healthy. Oh, yeah. Gets, gets my feet in the ground. Uh, I would do it barefoot if I could, but the park has a lot of other dogs that go there. So <laughs> <laughs> I keep my shoes on. Land, land mines. <laughs> yeah, that's exactly it. So I did want to uh, spend a minute and just ask individually if there's something that gets you excited about uh, finance. And Danielle, we can start with you. If there's something that really gets you out of bed in the, in, every day to take a look at these crazy markets that we're a part of. I mean, the main thing that gets me excited is making money. <laughs> Big move. <laughs> Because I mean, I just think that you're so limited when you have, you know, a paying job, you're, you're just, I mean, you're limited by however much you're paid per hour or per year or whatever. And so for me, I just love the limitless potential. I mean, it's been 
challenging lately over the course of the past few months. And it's definitely caused me to change a lot of my strategies. Like I am very good in a directional momentum market. And so, you know, that's something that normally you know, really gets me out of bed in the morning when I know that I have a really good setup that I can enter with the trend and with the way things have changed lately, I've definitely had to adjust and, you know, start some new strategies and trade more to the downside. So it hasn't been as exciting as I would say, but I still do find it exciting because I, I love a challenge and the market is a forever teacher. You know, you're never going to know everything. And even just having the ability to continually learn new strategies and new things and learn how to bend with the market, I guess. Um, for me, I really enjoy that. I, I would never do well in a type of, you know, corporate job where I have to do the same thing every day and go to meetings and all that kind of stuff. So for me, this is what works. Wow. That's great that you come to the markets with that energy. And Linda, I'm not quite certain. Are you still actively running money at this time or has I, it... I, uh, I actually retired like five years ago. Oh my so word. I, I stepped down, I gave up my CTO and I was also a CPA. I mean, wow. excuse me, a, a CPO. So I was a commodity pool operator. So, um, it just, uh, the regulatory environment, I found that was just very uh, heavy handed and cumbersome. It's not as favorable to a uh, small, my fund only had $150 million. So it just was not as favorable environment for that. And I was burned out, honestly, you know, and it just pissed me off when the uh, exchanges raised all their exchange fees, uh, you know, dramatically right then, um, because I was, I've got assistance i have to pay for their data you know i have to pay for my data i have like four systems i have to pay for data on and all of a sudden my monthly data bill was like almost seven thousand dollars and i was like mm. you know this is a sign from god you know <laughs> you know, I, I, the industry's been kind to me so i did i packed it up but um i took some time to write that book you know which was really hard and I mean, I still trade every day, but I'm trying to find a way. I mean, I just do it for my own personal, um, you know, fun. I don't have to do it. And I'm trying to pull myself back. I was going to stop trading completely at the beginning of the year and just like, you know, work on my tennis game. And I wanted to play on this team and everything, but the markets were just so crazy. And so I was talking with a friend uh, who on online, I have two or three trading buddies online. He said, look, you know, the VIX is above 22, you know, when the VIX is above 22, the opportunity is great. Just why don't you just continue to trade until it drops back down? Because then the ranges contract, the vol implied volatility contracts, and there's just not that same opportunity. And so I always had a saying, you know, take the cookies when they pass the plate around, you know, so when the opportunity is there, and for me as a trader, I can find that maybe 80% of my profits might come from just three or four lucrative months, you know, and then, you know, everything's just kind of less interesting. So that's what I did, you know, and I think there's just a little bit more play in here, you know, but, um, I, I, you know, it's, it's, um, it's, it's also a very marginal feeling having one toe in the water and one toe out of the water, because for me, you know, you talked Aaron about game playing. Okay. So, for me, that's the biggest thrill. I love playing games and I like winning. Okay. So it's not about the money. You know, it doesn't matter if it's playing bridge or anything else. I don't care about the dollars, but I like games that I can win. So I can't win at poker or blackjack or those types of uh, games, you know, so I don't enjoy going to a casino, but my game that I have that I've, you know, developed after all these years, you know, it's a lot of fun because I know, you know, I have something that I can go out there and do it every day. But in order for me to play my game well, it demands at least one and a half hours of preparation each night, you know, because it's not a mechanical system. It's discretionary and it's in the futures markets with high leverage. And so it takes a lot of preparation and organization, you know, for me to catch the things I want to catch. And I sort of resent that, you know, I don't want to be doing those kinds of hours in the evening anymore. And quite frankly, I'm a grandma now, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm tired at night, you know, <laughs> so, uh, 
So, uh, you know, I'm just trying to figure it out. I'm like, you know, I, I like it. So I have to try to make a uh, piece with that. And one of the things to do is like you schedule vacations, then it forces you to pull away. And that was also uh, something we couldn't do over the last uh, three years. So there you go. It does take time. That was wonderful. Really encapsulated uh, yeah. really what it takes. And we are going to wrap things up here ever so nicely. And uh, one last question, and that is if there was just a simple word or sentence of advice that you would give to someone starting out, doesn't matter if they're male or female, but uh, just something uh, I'll go ahead and start and uh, we can go around Erin and then Danielle and Linda. But one thing I've found over the years, not a lot of people talk about, but it's really how important your mindset is before you step into that trading room or to wherever you're doing and executing your uh, trading, that you come to the table with a very calm mindset centered. And I find that the decisions that come from that, in addition to that preparation, really are just much more exceptional. And Erin, any words of wisdom? You know, oh, yeah. I just would say, you know, having that stick to it -edness, <laughs> not sure what the, I know how I'm trying to say that, but really just to keep on going, you know, and to remember those wins when you get those wins and try and marinate in that. And that will keep you propelled. And really it's just always learning, always learning. And, you know, all of us are still in some sense learning, you know, mm -hmm. when we see something different in the market, because it's never the same every day. So, you know, just to really just to keep with it, it's it's worth it. It's a lot of fun, really. And mm -hmm. you don't have to like you were saying, Danielle, you don't have to come at it from a math background necessarily like, like I did or through an institution like you. Um, or off the trading floor like you, Linda. I mean, it's uh, you can start from anywhere. You know, I didn't sure. this job didn't exist when we were younger. I mean, there we I couldn't even conceptualize what I do now. So you just you keep on learning and and go with that flow and just don't give up. Well said. Well said, Danielle. Uh, words. That's of exactly wisdom. what I was going to say. I love it, Erin, because I I just think that it's a very challenging space to um, enter and get started unless you're, you know, more of a natural. So if you're a natural, that's, that's amazing. That's great. Probably won't be as difficult, but I know a lot of people aren't. And so I guess you just want to look at your goal. I mean, what do you ultimately want? Do you want to know how to manage your own money? Do you just want to learn more about finance? Do you want to, because I mean, when I got into it, it, it was never, I never intended for it to be, you know, my actual full time, you know, I'm going to go on TV and write a book and do all these things. I just wanted to manage my own money. So I just think there's so many different levels and so many different possibilities. And, you know, if you are interested in that space, there's so many different things you can do and just, you know, don't get discouraged. I know there's a lot of people that got into the market brand new right in 2020, 2021, and they're having a rough time right now. But I mean, the ups and downs provide a lot of different opportunity. And so if you stick with it over time, you know, you're going to see those results. Very good. Linda, we will wrap it up with you and any insights you care to share. Yeah, it's like anything. It's a game of persistence. You know, you need to be uh, autonomous. You know, you need to have that a drive to be self-sufficient and independent and do your thinking for yourself. You are not going to ever make it in this business if you have to follow or rely on somebody else's advice or guidance. In all fairness, it took me um, um, and 10 years before I, you know, 10 years of full-time trading before I felt like I had some control of the technicals and stuff. And then it took me another 10 years on top of that to, uh, you know, quantify things and develop things where I felt like I really, truly had a statistical edge. And I've been trading 20 years full time and I've been, you know, managing money. But I felt like, you know, it still was always, um, you know, I still had to do more and, and test more. And, and, you know, even though so it's like, yeah, I don't, it, it's not like being on the trading floor necessarily offered any advantage whatsoever with the technicals. It was a completely different universe. I mean, all the trading floor did was to buy me time in terms of gaining experience in watching the tape. 
okay? So I'm an excellent tape reader. That's not a tool that's good enough alone for you to make it as a professional trader, okay? And the last thing I want to say is that people don't have to be a professional trader. A lot of people feel like trading's glamorous, so we can make all this money, da 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 da. But there's a huge need for support people in this industry, be it technology, um, you know, assistance, analysis, um, teaching. You know, there's all kinds of different hats in this industry. So. People think that they want to be a trader and make their money that way. And then they find that they just don't really feel so comfortable with the risk aspect, or perhaps they don't have the capital. So don't put that pressure on yourself because it can always come a couple years down the road. I mean, so many people in this business got their start 40 years ago as stockbrokers and they weren't trading for themselves. They were providing support and guidance for clients. And so that bought them time to learn technical analysis and see the charts. Um, and then a lot of them eventually went out on their own when you had those uh, trading floors open up in the equity options. And that was back in 1978. So, you know, just always keep an open mind and uh, be mindful of your own comfort level and don't put pressure on yourself that it's such a glamorous, glorious ego thing, you know, because it's really not. And the minute you go there, you know, the markets are just going to come and, and humble you, you know, very quickly. So that's my part. Very words. true. <laughs> Wonderful. Okay. Ladies, this has been really incredible. I want to thank you. Insightful and great to get to know you guys better and a wonderful way to wrap up National Women's History Month here at Chartwise Women for StockCharts.com. And I- Oh, can I say one last thing? I, yes. I meant to say this earlier. Okay. Just as a little bit of history, because I adore history of the markets and culture and technical analysis. At the turn of the century, 100 years ago, 120 years ago, the richest person in the world, in the world, was a female trader by the name of Hetty Green, H-E-T-T-Y Green. She was fondly nicknamed, or not so fondly, the Witch of Wall Street. And in her career, she amassed a fortune of present day value $2.5 billion. So there I you go. We had two professors in the females uh, in, in the trading industry of 120 years I ago. I am so pleased, Linda, that you brought that up. We did a documentary. Our The producer of this show was a big part of that. And it aired last week all about Hetty and, oh. her, and the Witch of Wall Street. And I think you'll love it. It's, uh, it's oh, I can't wait to see it. Yeah, it's on stockcharts.com. So great Very stuff. Cool. And ladies, I just want to say thank you again for joining us here at Chartwise Women, Danielle Shea, Linda Ratchke, and of course, Erin Swinlin. I think this is an incredible way to end National Women's History Month. Well, Erin, that pretty much wraps it up for Chartwise Women. I am going to be miss seeing you every week, but of course, we will be sure and make time to see each other outside of this. And maybe we can take a minute and talk about what we do outside of Chartwise Women. For me, it's my Friday afternoon MEM Edge show. So please come on by and watch that. Erin, I know. Yes, I know it's going it, to, I'm going to be sorry not to see you once a week, True. but we do keep in touch and thank goodness we live fairly close to each other. So I do hope we'll, we'll be together again. Sure. But yes, I, I do have the decision point show. You can still get your fill of Aaron Swenlin on Mondays. The decision point show airs at 7 PM Eastern. And of course I have my free trading room for decisionpoint.com on Mondays, just go to the homepage and you can really get your fill of Aaron Swenlin by getting in the free trading room. But it's been my pleasure, Mary Ellen, working with Likewise. you and Stock Charts TV on this. Likewise, I could not agree more. And all of you that have been watching us with Chartwise Women, thank you and be sure and check us out with our other work here. Hey guys, Dave Keller here with StockCharts.com. Thanks so much for watching our video. If you enjoyed it, and we hope you did, Hit the like button right below. Also, we have so much new content every day. Consider subscribing to the channel. Just hit the subscribe button in the video or right below. Thanks for watching. Stay safe. Have a fantastic day.